Um, thank you, Alan, so much for that. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning, <clears throat> to be asked to be on this panel, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be a member of the mathematics educational community. On behalf of the three of us uh, standing up here, we'd like to take uh, a little more time just to thank the organizers of uh, Spark Me 2015. Um, just to name a few people, Bona Kang, <clears throat> Bona Kong, uh, Keanu Ross, Angela DeSalmas, and professors Jeff Sachs and Naylin Nasir, and all the graduate students in Berkeley's uh, Research and Cognition and Mathematics Education Program. Thank you so much for all the hard work. If you guys can see the flurry of emails, I've been going back and forth. It's been amazing to watch. Um, but in moving ahead with this discussion, each of us will um, step up and briefly comment on Alan's talk and give uh, some reactions, um, some responses. Um, and in moving ahead with my portion of it, um, I have an appreciation, a uh, disagreement, and a uh, no, and uh, an agreement. <laughs> Can't be too critical. <clears throat> So I just, uh, I just want to briefly talk about two aspects of the, uh, of the true model that Alan described. Um, as, uh, so the model, true, teaching for robust understanding. And so dimension three, access to mathematical content. Uh, to me, that refers to equalizing opportunity for student voice. So this, to me, seems like the frequency of student contributions. Alan even mentioned, if only a small group of students are the ones who are contributing to the conversation, that's not very equitable. Uh, the dimension four, uh, agency, authority, and identity. So once we, assuming we have equalized those opportunities, uh, dimension four to me speaks to within those opportunities, how can we then improve the quality of engagement um, for students and therefore learning? Uh, so while I appreciate the, uh, these particular dimensions of the true model and their implications for equity, which is central to a lot of folks' uh, research here in the room today, um, I would like to challenge <laughs> Alan uh, on their centrality and the assumptions of the, of the true model. <clears throat> Excuse me, for some reason my voice is really hoarse right now. So these three <laughs> So these, these dimensions are subsumed within the true model and they suggest that they are in service of the larger vision of that, of that which that model suggests which in turn suggests that these two dimensions are secondary or auxiliary to cognition and content. <clears throat> so this, to me, um, got me thinking about the certain assumptions about teaching and about uh, models that try to capture teaching and what's important. <clears throat> and it got me to ask this question, which I'm constantly asking myself, based on my own work as an educator and also the work that I've observed uh, um, in other educators. What is the primary charge of the teacher? What is the work that they set out to do, the goals they seek to accomplish through their practice? <clears throat> and so the true model, uh, although it presents a very powerful formulation of robust mathematical understanding, I believe it's only one pillar of what hypothetically could be a variety of TR dash pillars. For example, uh, TRI, teaching for robust identity. How about TRES, T-R-E-S, teaching for emotional security. How about T-R-S-D, teaching for spiritual development? These are models that uh, I have observed in, in classrooms as being central to the work that teachers do. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that mathematics does not play a central role in this. What I'm uh, trying to draw attention to is that the work of teachers is so immensely complicated and complex that what I see them doing is using mathematics as a means to accomplish these other uh, robust ways of being. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, challenge myself and, and everyone here to, to continue to think about what are the other pillars of, of, uh, of mathematics education. And a agreement. <laughs> I agree that the classroom is a promising site for doing uh, proactive and transformative research. And so <clears throat> hopefully, um, please consider what we are you know, presenting today as the beginning of something, the beginning of, of a conversation that we can carry out through the rest of the day. And um, yeah, and I guess one more thing, one more comment is one question that I'd like to ask with regards to the true model and you know, the common core is what are the implications of common core and models such as true uh, on managing and transforming the existing power dynamics. Because the kinds of activity structures 
and um, participation structures that are suggested uh, or envisioned in the Common Core uh, are, could, could pose a real challenge to teachers. So I not only see this as a shift in activity structure, but there's also a shift in material resources, which also has shifts in the teacher identity and also shifts in uh, managing the classroom power dynamics. So I'm just asking myself, what are these other kinds of, what are the implications for, um, for these different kinds of shifts? Thank you. So I not only get to follow Alan, I get to follow Jose. Um, and I, for those of you who are part of this community here at Berkeley, but also part of this broader community and have worked with Alan before, almost any com comment of Alan's begins with yes and. So I will say to you, yes and, that um, you present many challenges that come up in our work. And one of, I think, the really important challenges as we think about ourselves as methodologists is who is our methodology speaking to and speaking for? And I'm going to represent kind of the end of Jose's comments in thinking about the teachers that we work on behalf of and who we are asking to be the representatives of the change that we want to see happen. And that our work as we move forward needs to be about thinking about how do we help them leverage the common core, not be beholden to the common core. And how do our methods support a vision of teachers as change agents and a vision of teachers in this country as the people who will help us sort out the common core in powerful ways rather than the problematic force that's in the way of the common core which is going to change things for us. So I want to say that I really like your framing of what the common core is. It isn't what everybody currently believes the common core is. If that was that simple and if Alan Schoenfeld had that power on the people outside of this room, we would be moving forward in a slightly different direction. But there are plenty of folks who want to leverage the Common Core as either problematic or as a savior, and teachers as either problematic or disastrous. And it's part of our charge and our methodology to think about how we move forward with our research in ways that are careful to help teachers become stronger and more powerful. So that's my first comment as I thought about your talk. The second one was the getting the math right. And the current way that we have chosen to get the math right when we've worked on true math is by sitting in a room of like-minded people who come to community norms and agreements about what we mean about the math. And that doesn't actually translate necessarily outside of our conversation to other people. And certainly every time we have tried to write it down or we've looked at what other people have tried to write down about getting the math right, including folks in the Common Core, it ends up coming out wrong for other people. And so part of what I come to realize is that, again, our work as researchers is very closely tied to our work as practitioners in living out and giving people experiences of living math in ways that we believe are right and ongoing professional development ways so that there's a changing public perception about what mathematics is. Um, and I think embedded in your work is all of that, but it's our charge to actually try and go out and live it. Hi, so thank you um, to everyone again for coming and the conference organizers for this very special opportunity. Um, and thank you also to Alan for kicking things off this morning. I appreciate your call to think expansively about our goals and especially to think about the common core, uh, not as an endpoint in itself, but to think about uh, supporting all students to develop as powerful mathematical thinkers. I also want to highlight the fact that what it means to be a powerful mathematical thinker isn't itself something that naturally exists in the world for us to discover and push students toward, but it's something that is shaped by our collective conceptual analytic frameworks, to use Alan's term. This is true when we define powerful mathematical thinking in terms of getting the right answers on standardized tests. It's equally true when we define powerful mathematical thinking in terms of practices such as those that are held up in the Common Core. So the Common Core offers an opportunity to select different aspects uh, of mathematical activity as constructs of importance, not only in the academy but also in the public sphere. And maybe one day we'll see newspapers reporting on exhibitions of students' prowess in uh, constructing and critiquing arguments instead of reporting on the achievement gap. But I also think we have to be cautious about the ways in which whatever we select will shape what we see as well as what we don't see, as Alan has suggested. 
for example, particular ways of emphasizing, constructing, and critiquing arguments might obscure collaborative sense-making, the skills that that requires, and the powerful thinking that that can generate. We also need to be conscious about the ways that we link powerful mathematical thinking, however we define it, to issues of merit and desert. Who deserves access to college, careers, the opportunity to fulfill their own aspirations for their lives? Who deserves to be understood as a competent, powerful, and intelligent person? Alan has given us some compelling data that illustrate how this plays out in the arena of assessment. So through one lens, the SAT-9, students look like successes, and through another, they look like failures. And we have mountains of data to show that failure is disproportionately constructed for children from non-dominant groups, from the material resources our society provides to the ways of knowing and being that tend to be recognized in our schools. As researchers, we participate in these processes the lenses we wear don't just create issues of construct validity or some other hyper-researchy thing. Through them, our scholarship contributes to the reproduction or alteration of what our society values, what we problematize, and what we tacitly endorse. It is therefore our responsibility as well as our privilege to always keep at the forefront of our minds, as I believe Alan has, the kind of society we want to live in and the ways that our work advances us toward that society. So Jose, Kim, and I have all had a chance to share some of our reactions. We want to give you a chance to do so as well. So we're going to step back and ask Alan to come back up. Thank you. Floor is open. set of beliefs about how the world should work and the most appropriate way to achieve that particular idea. Can you be a bit more explicit about your ideologies that are at play here and also can you identify the areas where you're likely to be wrong through self-admission in what you present? I love these guys. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Uh, Thank you as well, Jose, Kim, and Nicole. Um, you know, my first reaction was, yay, identity and agency uh, for all of this. Um, well, the answer to your first question is, we grow and change. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, I've been talking with some mathematical colleagues uh, about definition, and one of the interesting things, because people, a lot of people think you do axiomatic mathematics by starting with a definition and you work forward. And um, the history of mathematics is actually much more complex, because definitions get revised over time. And the summary version of that is you choose the definition that makes it easiest to prove theorems. And I think Maybe I was still in that phase when I was talking about data, and that was a reflection of my ideology. Uh, I'm no less ideological now. I may be a bit more subtle. Um, the <laughs> um, when I moved from mathematics into education, one of the things that I said and um, really shaped what I did. I remember having a conversation with Deborah about this because Deborah said, Alan, why are you so pathological about modeling things? And my response was, she didn't use the word pathological. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> She's going, no. But, you know, Alan, I don't understand your deep felt need for building these models. Now she's nodding her head. Um, and my answer was, when I left mathematics, I left absolute truth. And what I seek in my work is ways to come as close to that 
as I can. And um, that means modeling in part because models are falsifiable. It says I make a claim, I build the model. If the model doesn't correspond to the behavior, then I know there's something wrong and that says I've got to challenge what I'm doing. Um, so yes, I believe in data, but I remember a comment that Andy DeSessa made, I think in 1987, when he came and joined my research group, we were building things and sharing in research groups. And I asked Andy to come because he had some very strong ideas. And one of the things he said was, I work on my ideas, and 95% of the time, I work on them full bore as though they're true, because that's the best way for me to make progress. The other 5% of the time, I critique like hell. And I think, you know, I've tried to live up to that. Uh, we're modeling in the real world. We're making certain assumptions. I push those things as hard as I can, but among other things, I try to make um, enough data available and create enough of an environment so that people will push back because it's in the give and take that we really make progress. Uh, this is a community at large that doesn't all have the same goals, but they're in close enough parts of the space so that we make cumulative progress and we do that really well when, um, as in the tape, we don't go, you're wrong and I've scored some ego points, but I disagree and let's work this through. Um, where might I be wrong? All over the place, uh, but more specifically, um, I think actually Jose's comments point to one way that's problematic. Um, when I think about the work that I did in building true, what I tried to do was something that I learned from Fred Reif many, many years ago. The question is, can you build what he called a nearly decomposable system? Uh, and that is, it's got aspects that are semi-independent, but that function. So you take the human body and you ask the question, how can we take it apart for purposes of analysis? One way to do that is to say, well, there are the arms, the leg, the torso, the head. That's taking it apart, but those parts aren't really independently functional. They don't interact with each other very well. So that's not a useful decomposition. Another decomposition is circulatory system, respiratory system, skeletomuscular system, nervous system, et cetera. Each of them has its own integrity. Each of them interacts with the others in interesting ways. So you can't really talk about the respiratory system without talking about the circulatory system, but you can spend a lot of attention on each one do problem solving on it, if you will, make progress. And what I try to create in true is a such system that then you could work on systematically in the real world. Um, but as I said, any lens, any framework casts certain things into relief, obscures others. Physiology probably has it close to right. I'm sure there are alternate perspectives that would come up with a different nearly decomposable system that might highlight some aspects of classroom interactions or some aspects of social justice or some aspects of um, the importance of interconnections between people in much better and more central ways than I've got. And um, I'd like to see those developed. I'd like to see those pushed. Um, and I think it's going to be in interactions between us on that level that we ultimately wind up focusing as a community on what counts. Okay. Yes, Karen. So when you're talking about this idea of decomposable systems, and part of the focus of this conference is on 
policy implications of the work that we do, or that you do, I'm not a mathematics person. Um, and it seems as though much of the focus of your talk was on work in classrooms, <clears throat> but all of this work sits inside a larger system. So the discussion you had with the person from science in Chicago, it's absolutely no surprise of what we would do in Chicago. And I'm looking forward to what you're doing in Oakland, and I think Paul's here, and he's doing some work in districts now. <clears throat> but there's a sort of another level of question in terms of systems, and that has to do with <clears throat> um, policymakers at the federal, state, and district levels. Some of the complications right now that's happening with, with Common Core, states that are backing out of the assessments and the like, what's going to happen when <clears throat> Smarter Balance and Park are given, and so many kids are gonna bomb on this, right? <clears throat> but how do you think about the, um, the ways in which the research community can interact and have um, influence, I'm gonna put in quotes, with systems that go beyond classrooms, so schools as organizations, districts as organizations, uh, around the kinds of issues that you've talked about. And, and uh, one other thing that I want to add, and that is that there's, there's, there's the, the notion of um, sort of policy making systems, federal, state, school level, et cetera. There's also system, when you're talking about the body uh, a model, there's also sort of the systems of kids as individuals and kids in communities. So their uh, perceptions of what they're doing, um, their, some of which you've alluded, their history of participation in mathematical practices, but also I think some of Danny's work in terms of um, factors outside of classrooms that kids are wrestling with in terms of navigating this complex kinds of mathematics you're talking about. I'm waiting for an easy question. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, another of my flaws in response to Danny is not lack of ambition. Um, let me tell you about the expansive imperialist version of true, which gets at some of what you're talking about, men talk about politics in general. Um, if you look at the five dimensions, dimensions two, three, dimension one is about the mathematics. If you're a literacy person, now think ELA and the Common Core ELA standards in your vision of them. If you're a science person, think about the next generation science standards and your vision of them. Okay. So, dimension one for powerful classrooms in domain X, your vision of what makes them powerful. Dimension two, kids engaging in productive struggle through cognitive demand. Dimension three, equitable access to that content. Dimension four, the environment supporting the building of agency, authority, and identity. Dimension five, an environment that's responsive to the people in it so that it meets them where they are. Okay. That says, and we're having conversations with some, some school districts, you can actually have cross-disciplinary conversations where if you show the videos, and you show that video, you know, a multiple subject credential teacher or a social studies teacher can look at the things that happen and talk about it using the language of those five dimensions and you can show videos to social studies and English language arts and have the same conversations. That provides a language for talking about powerful instruction writ broad. That's step one in the imperialist agenda or step two if you make math step one. Step three is think about any learning environment, including a school or a district. What do you want? You want best practices. You have a vision of what it is for the people in that district, not only teachers, but the administrative support to be doing things that ultimately support powerful learning in classrooms. How do you want to do that? Well, you want to meet people where they are 
providing them with the kinds of support that enable them to grow through productive struggle. Whether it's a teacher engaged in professional development, whether it's an administrator trying to figure out how to do that, whatnot. It damn well better be equitable, and here I'll use equity in the large sense. You want everybody to have those opportunities for growth in equitable ways, and in ways that support agency, authority, and identity. I want my teachers to go, I'm part of the best school in the world and will prove it, and my job is to make these kids the most powerful thinkers I can possibly make them. And you make that by creating a responsive community. So I see the categories of true as lenses through which you can look at any learning environment. Now, unfortunately, the US Senate is not a learning environment. Uh, and there are very serious political issues. So I'll go back. Um, my God, 37 years. In 1978, Jim Rutherford went to the National Science Foundation. I started late. Okay. I know. Yeah. With the mandate from, at that point, it was President Carter to build a two, 10 year plan for science and math education. And um, he worked on it for two years. NSF was about to put it in place when Ronald Reagan was elected. And Reagan's first act was to line item education out of the NSF budget. Okay. Moaning and groaning, gnashing of teeth. It was terrible. A couple of smart congressmen said, well, we can't let this happen. Why don't we put engineering in, the engi in education in the engineering directorate? They'll never think to look for it there. It worked. Ten years later, the NSF budget for education was three times what it had been when Reagan tried to line item it out. When I think about our field and I think about the spectacular progress we've made in understanding not only thinking and learning but the social context and surrounds that support it, my mathematical model is something like kx plus sine x. There are lots of ups and downs, but the general trend is we know a lot more and we're making progress. So, you know, sometimes you duck and cover. Sometimes, like when No Child Left Behind was put in place, you clench your stomach in pain. But you do everything you can on every front you can to make a difference. So two weeks ago, I was working with superintendents, math coaches, uh, principals, and teachers from 13 school districts in California that have between them somewhere between one and a half and two million kids talking about true and talking about doing it across the boards. Now maybe that'll help, maybe it won't, but with friends doing that kind of thing, um, it was David Foster doing PD in Chicago for the district, it was Phil Darrow doing New York, and we try to get things out there and we try to look for places where there's influence. And as a community we have it, I wasn't on the national math panel, but Deborah was. She had access to voices uh, that I don't have access to. Same for Linda Darling Hammond. You know, we work, I think we have, within ourselves there may be differences. When we look at ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the world at large, we're pretty coherent and we have a bunch of strong voices. We just keep at it. As I said, that's what gets me up in the morning. Those of you who are at the beginning stage of your careers, Keep at it, and if that model is accurate, you are the ones who will help make it that much better down the road. And it will include the kinds of things that Carol asked about. Social context and other things. Um, math can, and their study on that too, be a lever for equity, a tool for equity. And I'll stop there because there's no one better to turn it over to on that <laughs> score than Ayla. Hi, did want to make a comment.